Thank you all so much for being here. This is a beautiful community of people that I'm standing in front of. So the strategy for this evening is that um, each of us will share some slides and talk for about 10 minutes, hopefully. And then you'll have, and then we'll just open up the space for conversation uh, among all of us, okay? So that's the strategy. I hope it works. Um, hold on just a second. Here are my notes. Um, okay, so it's my job to introduce the, uh, the Russia study tour. Um, oops, give me a minute. I want to offer a caveat. Here you see a photo of um, some gentlemen representing the Russian Veterans for Peace community, plus some of our, uh, I guess it's Americans, who are also representing Veterans for Peace. Um, so my caveat is this. If you believe that Russia is our enemy, this could be playing with your brains a little bit, right? Brain research says very clearly that it can be painful when our fixed ideas are challenged. So if you have fixed ideas about Russia, about Vladimir Putin, about Russians, try to be aware when we are triggering that response. Hang on to it. We'll talk about it later when we open up for questions, OK? Um, here's the group that we traveled with. Um, Kudos to Bruce Gagnon for gathering a community of people, all of whom were um, quite excited to visit Russia. I think there's a little gadget here. You see that the group, the youngest people in the group, Manisha, she is from um, Bank Nepal. Nepal. I almost said Bangladesh. I'm a little nervous. She's from Nepal. And here is um, Bill Bliss's son, Lincoln. Those two were 24. They were the youngest in the group. Um, this gentleman, John Shushard, celebrated his 80th birthday um, on the trip to Russia. This is was, that's the gift that he gave himself. And there may be a few others that were um, in their 80s. Um, so this is, this, is the core this is the group that we um, traveled with in our, in our adventure. Um, many of the people in this group were Global Network members. Some are also veterans for peace. I want to give a big shout out to Will Griffin, he is uh, also one of the younger members of the group. He's both a member of the Veterans for Peace and Global Network. He has um, a website called The Peace Report. He's a veteran of both the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so he's someone to keep an eye on if you are watching movers and shakers in the peace community. So I know that you're all wondering about food. Um, I want to get rid of all the necessities before we dive into what we were doing there. Um, let me just say up front, the food was really great. Some say the food is exceptional because Russia doesn't allow GMOs. Um, we ate a lot, and we never had a bad meal. Um, the guides for our, for our group, this gentleman on the left, his name is Leonid. He is um, an activist from Ukraine. He had to flee the country because of the conflict, um, the coup d'etat that happened there. He now lives outside of Moscow, and he's a member of the Coordination Council of the Union of Political Emigrants and Political Prisoners of Ukraine. He speaks 10 languages. He's now on the advisory board of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Um, he was a brilliant um, communicator and interpreter for us, not only in terms of language, but also um, in terms of culture and history. Tanya Bukharina, um, she, is, she supported us in Moscow and organized our tour through Crimea. Some of you here know her because she came to, um, to speak to us back in April. She's a true friend. Um, she's working on a pr project right now with Regis Trembley, and she'll be here for the month of July. So maybe we'll see a little more of Tanya. So I'm going to show you three maps. This first is a map of all of Russia. Um, and you can see that it's a huge, huge state. So, and you'll also see that we barely touched the surface, right? We, our trip took us to Moscow, to St. Petersburg, 
and then also down to, um, here we go, into uh, Crimea. This is Ukraine and this is Crimea. When we were in, we, st we started the trip in Moscow. Um, we spent five days there. Um, the trip was organized so that from nine to noon every day we had lectures and conversations, mostly with uh, some from our internally, but mostly with the Russian community. And then the afternoons, we were on our own to go tour around the city. We ended our tour in St. Petersburg. Um, we spent four days there. Uh, we had one day where we were all touring together, but the rest of it we um, explored on our own. Um, and we were able in St. Petersburg on May 9th to participate in their victory day, the victory over the Nazis. Um, and that was quite a special event. I'm sure my colleagues are going to tell you more about that day. But 1.2 million people were marching in the street holding images, holding photos of uh, family members who fought in that war some of whom died. So again, this is a picture of Ukraine. Uh, this is Ukraine here, and this is um, Crimea. And we visited, we flew into the city of Simferopol, Simferopol um, and then uh, drove down to Yalta and finally visited Sevastopol. So we visited those three amazing, amazing cities. So. Impressions. Before leaving for, um, for Russia, when I told folks, including some family members, um, I was surprised how often I was told to be careful, right? Um, I had people tell me things like, Vladimir Putin is evil, um, that he can't be trusted, that I can't believe what people tell me in Russia because they're afraid to speak, um, and People are, people are not free to speak the truth in that country. So it's um, stunning to me how much um, anxiety we have in this country about the unknown and how much the fear mongering of another country kind of permeates us cellularly. Um, I can tell you that I wasn't afraid to go to Russia and um, I was so, um, it was so confirming that the people in this country are kind of just like us pretty amazing, wonderful, open, eager to um, connect, and uh, just doing f ama wonderful things with their lives. So this, um, this young woman, her name is Rina. Um, she was practicing English by talking with us. We ran into her in a park. Um, and she happens to be the tandem bicycle champion in Russia. Um, the, when, when you compete in tandem bike riding, the person behind you is blind. So she does the, 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 um, the seeing, and the two of them together do the pushing, the pedaling, uh, and she's quite proud of how good she is at that particular skill. This young woman, um, her name is Mary. She, I met her in uh, Crimea. She was an interpreter. We had a press conference at one point, and so this lovely debate teacher brought in her high school students um, and had them come and practice their English by being interpreters for us and helping us navigate um, opportunities to talk with other people. So Mary um, is quite a debater and a lovely kid, and it was really fun to see her purple hair and her um, ambitions to be an international lawyer. Um, over here um, is a community of people. This woman, Valentina, is a friend of um, Tanya's. So a few of us visited the school that she runs. Um, she, um, the students that come to the school all have uh, cognitive disabilities, some with physical disabilities as well. Um, and she just provides a beautiful program for them. They were thrilled. They had never met Americans. So we were able to make a powerful connection. They sang and they danced for us. They wore traditional clothes. And uh, we had a beautiful, and of course they gave us gifts. And so we had a beautiful connection. So um, I can tell you that there's so much to say about this experience, but uh, the connections with individuals was really, of course, the richest part of the experience. I also want to say that families are really important. Um, Tanya told us that during, after the fall of the Soviet Union, things were so hard in the country, there was just no food to eat. And so people stopped having kids. 
they went f for 10 years um, really containing the family life. Um, but that's not the situation anymore. And hopefully some of these photos give you an expression of um, the fact that kids are out playing and kids are out playing with their families and men my age are holding the hand of very old men and they're walking and engaging and being family together. Um, so that was a beautiful part of the experience for me as well. Um, the other clear fact is that Russia is a capitalist country. Um, among the many speakers that connected with us, there was a gentleman named Constantine, who was probably in his 40s, maybe a little older. Um, and he in particular spoke about how sad he is about his country's move away from the ideas of solidarity, collective work, shared resources, socialism. He's a socialist living in a capitalist country. And he had a very long lecture to give us about the dangers of capitalism and what capitalism has wrought in the world and how much suffering exists in the world because of a capitalist system. Um, so it was a powerful, powerful um, lecture that he gave us and it has left me with a lot of food for thought. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end now with this, with this story. Um, one of the other things you come away from Russia with is how deeply history is known and felt and experienced, um, and it has been through the millennia. Um, war has come to Russia's homeland throughout its history. Um, and Russian, Russians remember the lived ideals of its revolution and the devastation of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Russians told us over and over again that particularly the Russians for peace, they want nothing to do with war, but they are really clear and they understand the need to defend themselves. So this, this is a monument at the 35th battery um, in Crimea, in the city of Sebastopol. This is a way gave us a tour. We literally walked down into these bunkers that were built into a mountain. Um, this is the story, I get, here's the numbers. When the Nazis came to Crimea, they took the most of Crimea pretty quickly, but in Sebastopol, um, it took eight to nine months the people defended that city so powerfully and so strongly. Sevastopol, Sevastopol lost up to 300,000 people in this Nazi invasion, and Crimea lost as many as 600,000. So this was the most powerful museum I've ever been to in my life. Um, as they take us down into the bunker, we see where people um, slept or didn't sleep. We saw this pitiful small room where doctors performed surgery. Um, and we heard the anguish of the experience of having this brutal invasion in their country and the proud, the, pr the sense of pride that people held off um, for so, so many months um, to try and protect the people of their city. So when you, what, what you do in this museum is you walk into this, this room where there's a wall of photos of people who lost their lives to that war. Um, and, and you're asked to spend some time in the quiet, to light a candle and spend some time in the quiet and meditate with them. And then you walk into a room and you see um, the names of many, many, many of the people who have died are just surrounding you on the walls. And then you walk into finally a third room where there's a rounded ceiling and you, you start by seeing the, the lights go down and you're seeing the night stars. Um, and then one by one, each of those stars turns into the face of, of someone who lost their life. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing children and old people and soldiers and, and here you are kind of, quite frankly, overwhelmed. <laughs> and each image, each person <laughs> eventually turns into another star that is shooting through the skies. It is such a powerful anti-war um, expression and there are many anti-war expressions. <laughs> in this beautiful country, and I'm, I'm grateful that I had a chance to go there and start, uh, start my relations, a different relationship with Russia. Russia has tulips. We were there in the spring. Now it's Bill Bliss's turn.
Thank you, Mary Beth. It's beautiful. Just to tag on to what Mary Beth was saying about that woman that you saw standing there in, in the 35th Battery in Sevastopol, we had an opportunity to talk with her after she gave this hour-long tour, and her knowledge of history is so deep and inspiring. And then we found out that, um, just in a conversation one-on-one -on -one with her, that her husband is in the Army. And so in the events that unfolded in 2014, moving from the coup d'etat in Kiev to the sense of the folks in Crimea that they were next, her husband was very much involved with that, and, and she as well. And so they moved to a citizen's referendum to ally with Russia, to become a part of Russia instead of being a part of Ukraine, which they had been since um, Crimea was, one of, was part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So, so, but just to, to feel her passion in composing her, her speech that she gave to us, uh, it was so personal. It was a beautiful experience. Um, oh, where's the clicker, Mary Beth? Wait, wait, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay. Food, food, yeah. <laughs> I, I've only got 16 slides, and four of them are bowls of borscht. I really like borscht. <laughs> and so I just took a lot of pictures of it. It's really, really good. Have you ever had borscht? It's basically yeah. beet stew. It sounds pretty uninspiring, but they always serve it with um, a little sour cream, so I've already, I've already dabbed my sour cream in there. And uh, a biscuit, usually with some cilantro on it. And then this over here, well, how do you do that? I don't, I don't, that's, that's lard. I never put that in my borscht, but you're supposed to put that in your borscht. Every bowl of borscht I had, had where is Let it? Let me show you this top. Oh, yeah. There. Lard. <laughs> Sour cream, biscuit, borscht. I like to eat. Um, I want to just share my experience in, in, in three lenses. First, personally, why I chose to go on this journey. Second, from a perspective of, of our family, um, our sons, Lincoln and Ray, came along, and that was inspiring. Their mother, my wife, Lucinda, was invited, but she couldn't come. So that was just a really amazing uh, experience for us. And then thirdly, I would just like to share briefly uh, about traveling to Russia as a person of faith. But first, personal. So this is a, uh, a symbol that I grew up with. Um, so I'm, I'm a Cold War baby. I was born in 1957. I grew up with the Iron Curtain and the Cold War. And, and when I was six years old, my father started building a bomb shelter in the basement of my house. And, um, so I grew up with that awareness of playing on a bomb shelter. It was really, really nice for kicking a soccer ball up and down. But as a six, seven-year-old, I never really got it. We used to go inside there and see the canned food and the water. and. We just knew that there was a, a shadow of fear over everything. And so uh, I want to say about, about my, my family and my dad, some of you probably knew my mom and dad. By 1967, when I was 10, they were standing in front of Longfellow House on Congress Street in Portland, vigiling to end the Vietnam War, which they did until the war ended. So they did that for every Wednesday for six years. So I also grew up with that consciousness. Um, and so I've been able to replace the um, oh, the sense of fear and opposition and othering of Russia with intellectually. But I went to Russia because I needed to have my Cold War mind blown because most of that stuff lives unconsciously and, and deep inside. And so I, I came to a real appreciation of, of this symbol. And it's a beautiful symbol. And I, I can reappropriate it for myself as a beautiful symbol. Um, of what they attempted to do. And it was one of the first insights that, that we got. Our, our son, Lincoln, is really expert in Marxism. He knows basically week by week what happened 1917 through 1919, you know, and what was going on. So I just learned so much from him. And, and our other son, Ray, is a real expert in Russian history. So I learned a lot from my kids about this. Um, but in our first few days in Moscow, I began to feel, I forget how Mary Beth put it so well, but that, that deep in the DNA of the Russian people is the awareness of this experiment of, of honoring workers and collective effort. And it's so evident in the, the culture, in the feeling of being out in the public places, in the sense of uh, respect and courtesy, uh, in the care for the civic space in the public square and the sophistication of the infrastructure and the cleanliness of everything. And, and I just like, 
I don't like to admit, but I was really surprised by that. And I, and I, I know that I subconsciously expected to feel surveilled all the time, and, and, and I just didn't. And it was kind of, what, where is that? Um, I found in the cities we were in, in Russia, uh, Moscow, Simferopol, Sevastopol, and St. Petersburg, I felt less police presence. I felt how much in the last 20 years of my life we in America have intentionally militarized our public space so that we're really accustomed when we go to an airport to seeing soldiers with big weapons and to seeing guns quite frequently. I didn't see a gun the whole time I was there. Maybe when they were preparing for the May 9th parade, the soldiers were out in their uniforms and formations. But I felt really um, relaxed and secure. And, and so then I had to deal with the surprise of that. So by the second or third day, there was a lightness of being there that, that could open up some appreciation. So I just want to, I want to name that. That's the hammer and the sickle, the, the Marxist notion that the workers and the, the peasants or the farmers with the, the uh, there are the wheat, um, staffs of wheat and the rising sun. And under here, it, it says, and you, it, that was what came off the screen, uh, that Marxist quote that you've heard, proletarii vsech stran soedinyats, workers of the whole world come together. And we hear that as the slogan, workers of the world unite. I was really aware that this was an experiment. It went awry in all kinds of ways, but that's still there in the, in the culture, in the consciousness, and I really appreciated that. Um, so here's the side-by-side uh, existence of the ideal and the experiment. Everywhere you see monuments to, uh, uh, to Lenin. And so there, there's a, a Lenin monument right up on a, this is in Moscow, on a really fancy storefront, Valentino. I, it, that's where the oligarchy shops. And there are Mercedes and BMWs zooming around. Many more Ladas and smaller cars, many fewer SUVs than we have here in the United States. But yes, it, their, uh, capitalism is on the march. And they talk about the, the decade after the fall of the Soviet Union as the lost decade, <clears throat> during which um, President Yeltsin, basically operating like a mob boss, began to give away all the, all the uh, state industries to his cronies. And they just conjured an oligarchy there, which is, is, still has a grip on things. A lot of people ask, is it, are, are, are people in Russia free to talk about what they've been through? And I, I found it remarkably so that they're open and educated and want to talk about it. This is a remarkable place we went to in St. Petersburg called the Museum of Russian Political History, in, in which there's just a really forthright telling of their story from the Romanovs through uh, the Soviet era and into the modern era. So for instance, um, we know that when Lenin died in 24, Stalin took over, and the next 30 years until he died were brutally repressive years. What you're looking at is an, a display in the Museum of Russian Political History of the amount of iron ore that a gulag resident, prisoner, would be required to move by wheelbarrow from the mine to the, uh, to the rendering factory every day in order to earn his bowl of gruel. So they're very open about this, and, and the legends set, tell you that the average life expectancy in the gulag was two years. So it was just about being worked to death. So they, they have that in their, in their memory as well. I took this slide of, of a display in that museum. It, it really got my attention, and I just wanted to, to, uh, to read this with you. So here we are, June 16th, 1996 is the date, so the middle of that lost decade. And in the English translation, the first round of the Russian presidential elections, so uh, Yeltsin became president in 91 or two after uh, manipulating that, um, but then was elected in 1996. Pre-election spin technologies are applied on a mass scale. Is this beginning to sound familiar? <laughs> Big business and oligarchs pay for the presidential election campaign entitled Vote or Lose. And Boris Yeltsin's rating grows from 5 to 35%. Yeltsin was very, very unpopular in the mid-90s in Russia. He made really good friends with President Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton sent American political operatives over there to, to help him, Dick Morris uh, primarily, to convince them how, how to get this guy elected. 
So I just present this because it's a little bit of a response to what's so much in the news now about um, the oligarchy in Russia and the, the authorities in Russia manipulating our election. My response to that is, of course they are. That's what we do, superpowers uh, do to one another. And so they, we know where they learned it. This is, uh, now we're down in Crimea. And I spent the winter in Maine in my first taste of spring was when we flew down to Crimea, and Crimea is, is this beautiful um, a place on the Black Sea where it was warm and it was spring. I'm going to try to get this to roll as a video. It's about a, a one-minute video. This will reinforce some of what Mary Beth was saying about uh, uh, new children coming along and how, how wonderful that is. So I was at a park in Simferopol, Crimea. Teenagers showing off for one another. But watch the little girl, the little maybe year and a half, two year old girl, learning how to walk. Dad taking a photograph, just like you might see in the park here. She's so cute. You know, just folks in the park on a beautiful spring day with a, a beautiful rainbow in the fountain. So. <laughs> and another bowl of borscht. <laughs> so how good to, to um, have my mind blown, to have my, some of my unconscious assumptions brought to the surface and resolved and, and to feel free and to sit in a, in a park on a beautiful spring day in Crimea and just uh, feel the common human connection. Uh, so I also experienced this trip as a, as a, a father. There's our, <laughs> our group shot, uh, Lincoln and Ray. It's, uh, Peter the Great's summer palace. That we, this is the second to last day of our, of our time there. And they, you get that they were just building palaces um, because they had the ability to. And, and they were always, they were, you could find the figure there's like 2.4 kilos of gold in this particular room or display. But anyway, we had a good time. Um, who, who doesn't want to go see uh, Lennon's Rolls Royce? You know, I'm really into cars, and that's my son Ray. <laughs> Uh, having fun with, uh, with Lennon's Rolls Royce. <laughs> but I want to say also about um, the, the intergenerational experience of being in this delegation of 24 people. I was the, at age 62, I was the fifth youngest. So it was, and I'm old, right? I mean, well, so to, to, um, to experience that with, with younger people was really profound. And, and I don't mean in the way that we would assume. In fact, it was a little irritating to my kids to have older people like me look at them and say, oh, you're, you're the youth. We're so, we depend on you. And, and, and um, that's all true. But they're like, the, the sense I get from my kids is, hey, you know, don't lay that on me. And don't tell me to read your Noam Chomsky books and your Howard Zinn. I know all that. And, and these kids, they, they know how we've messed it up. And, and they, how oh, I would put that is they, they've seen, they can see our sorrow and our, and our shame um, and our fear. And they don't want to learn that. They want to learn from it and, and find a, a different way. So it was really inspiring to, to feel, yes, a new generation coming on with a much broader understanding. These are global citizens. Um, I don't think you can avoid being a global citizen today with the internet and with your, with your iPhone. So I say that as a message of hope um, and just the dynamic within the group. I found myself at the nexus of my relationship with my boys, which really matured and, and we learned a lot and have a lot of things to talk about and laugh about for some years to come. But also feeling how I fit into the group of, you know, kind of crusty old lefty peaceniks. And, and, <laughs> What, need, what might need to be retired from that and what wisdom might need to be kept. I'm not suggesting anything, but just the awareness of that. 
So our son Ray is a uh, real Russian history buff. So in our free time, we said, Ray, you just tell us where we need to go. So he took us someplace we never would have gone otherwise, which was to the Fabergé Museum in uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, so I don't know if you know, Fabergé was this in incredible craftsman in the mid-19th century. And his shop produced, I think, 81 eggs that went out as, as the Romanov's diplomatic gifts around the world. And now they're coming back home. They've got about 23 of them back in this museum. So. I just loved that more than I even knew I was going to love it. It's beautiful. Here is uh, Tsar Nicholas's carriage. Um, and it's just so, the photo doesn't do it justice. It's just so detailed that when they needed to restore the actual carriage in about 1950, they actually went to this model to figure out how to put the thing back together. You saw this picture earlier, uh, this man earlier, his name is Will Griffin. Um, and I, I, I present his picture and his beingness because it really felt great to have him become part of uh, my boy's life. He was the third youngest person on the journey, um, or maybe the fourth with the, the woman from, uh, from Nepal. And, and uh, my children and Will really bonded over their nicotine addiction. I've never been more grateful for my children's nicotine addiction because they could kind of withdraw and they would all be over there sucking on their, what do they call them, uh, vape pens. And, and I really enjoyed them getting to know Will. Um, I'm going to leave the geopolitics of this all to Bruce because he's so much more expert in this, <laughs> truly. Uh, um, but when we were introducing ourselves, Will introduced himself, Will Griffin, as a a veteran of George W. Bush's surge in Iraq and Barack Obama's surge in Afghanistan, and a person with uh, PTSD, uh, uh, the son of an American uh, Army uh, GI, and, uh, and his mother was a Korean woman, and he grew up on Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. And he said that after his several tours of duty, he found himself back at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, and he came to the awareness that he was, how did he put it, a watchdog for the global oligarchy. And so that's when he quit military service and went into his full-time peace activism. And he's just an inspiring person. You should really go to his peace report um, because he, he does all that work on the edge of his, of his uh, trauma and internalized anxiety from all of those experiences he had. He's right now, he tried to, he asked me to get a picture of him. That's the balcony from which uh, Lenin gave his speech in, I believe, October 1917 to inspire the masses. His study is right in behind that. And, and Will wanted to, I couldn't get my camera down quite far enough to get him actually up on that balcony giving his speech. But I love that, that picture of, of Will. So, oh, oh, so this was, uh, this is, this is just a little reflection on going as a person of faith. You know, there's a lot of churches in, in Russia, and they, the Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox faith was very much suppressed during the Soviet era, but no surprise, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it, it came back really strong. Um, and we would go into church buildings or see church buildings, and people <coughs> would know what I do. I'm a, a pastor. They would say, oh, these buildings must be so cool for you, Bill. And I'm like, I'm not really that into buildings. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm really aware of the burden of buildings. And so my, my, uh, my stock response with that would be, well, I suppose uh, God can work with anything, even old, ornate buildings, I guess. Um, but we went into this one place. This is at the Cathedral of Spilled Blood, which is uh, built on the site where Tsar Nicholas was uh, assassinated in 1861. And you know, one of my favorite songs about Jesus is, uh, is over my head, I hear Jesus in the air. There must be a God somewhere. So I took this nostril shot of myself, <laughs> and that Jesus is about, about 60 feet above me in this just grand, grand church. Um, as a person of faith, I, I am a post religious person of faith. I see religion as the disease of humanity. Um, I see religion as full of violence, founded in violence. And then I will uh, speak paradox when I say that as a disciple of Jesus, I think that's what he was 
seeking to transcend and to get beyond, to have a non-religious spiritual practice and to show us that way. But it's no surprise that with our, ha our ancient habits of sacrifice, sacrifice is violence, um, of understanding deity and divinity as, ex as excluding by nature, as saying who's in and who's out, um, that that is in our practices, in our, in our uh, faith life. But it doesn't, uh, but one of my favorite things Jesus ever said is in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, he looked out at the crowds and he had mercy on them because he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I really feel that for global humanity. We, we operate like sheep without a shepherd and we have a shepherd. It is uh, loving kindness. Uh, the power of love that is in each of us. And, and for me, Jesus really shows me that way. So I took this shot of, of myself standing under Jesus over my head. And this is a, another video uh, that I'll go click on in a moment. Our, our last day was May 9th, which is uh, Victory Day. The, the Russians call what we call World War II, they call that the Patriotic War or the Great, the great Patriotic War. And May 9th, the, the conclusion of that war and the ending of the 900-day siege of Leningrad in which over a million people died, most of them of starvation. So that May 9th was a very, very significant day for them. Um, 28 million Russians died in the Great Patriotic War. That's 50 for every American that died. Not to, not to uh, belittle that at all, but it, for them, it's comes home much more because also it was on their land. And the perception that I hear is that, hey, we Russians, we defeated Nazism and fascism with a great cost. And within five years, they were being demonized already by the mid-50s and Eisenhower had, I think, 2,000 nuclear warheads by 1955 or 56. Um, so it was really a deep honor to march in this parade with them. I brought a, a photograph of my father, who served in World War II, to celebrate that time when we were cooperating in that, in that war. And that was really touching. We were invited to, to march with a group. And what they do on, on May 9th is they walk three miles from, there's a loop in the Neva River, and they walk from one side of their city about three miles to the other side, and just walk along, sometimes singing patriotic songs, but holding photographs of their loved ones. see Soviet flags, you see Russian flags, and just, just people walking along. I think I've got just a picture of this guy who, who uh, Mary Beth introduced us to, Leonid, one of our guides who's become a lifelong friend, a, a dissident who uh, can't safely go back to his home in, in Ukraine. Um, but I think when we went down to Crimea and saw the Black Sea, this was the first time Leonid had seen the Black Sea in about 10 years or more, and so I just love the look of joy on his face. It contains so much of uh, the pride and the sense of home and belonging, so thank you. All right. At the end of uh, the era of the Soviet Union, at the time of the collapse in the early 90s, there was the Western desire to reunite Germany east and west. And in, in, the, new, in the new time, the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet bloc dissolved because there was no need for it anymore. And Russian President Gorbachev was promised by the United States, by Secretary of State Jim Baker, that uh, NATO would not expand one inch towards Russia. But that turned out to be a lie. And so today we see NATO on steroids advancing on Russia. 
It was during Bill Clinton's time in office that he expanded the enlargement, what I call the steroidal enlargement of NATO. And recently we've heard about Ukraine, that Russia attacked Ukraine, that Russia occupied Crimea, seized it, annexed it, stole it. But what you're not told is that in the western part of Ukraine, very uh, reactionary part of Ukraine, a hero, this man in the middle here at the top, Stefan Bandera, sitting amongst the th three German uniforms, is a Ukrainian nationalist. When Hitler swept through Ukraine, Bandera put on a Nazi uniform, gathered his supporters, and joined the invasion of Russia. Well, just recently, the new Ukraine, the new free Ukraine, since the 2014 coup d'etat, Bandera has been made a national hero of Ukraine. And the first thing that was done in the new Ukraine in 2014 was the outlawing of the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. And so today, Bandera and his forces are used by the United States and NATO to go to the eastern side of the country. They're from the western side of Ukraine. And they're sent to the eastern side of Ukraine to attack their fellow citizens, Ukrainian citizens who live along the Russian border, who want to continue to speak Russian. They're culturally Russian. They have family just over the border in Russia. And they're intact. And this is what's called the Donbass region, this, this part along the Russian border. And it's the Bandera forces who are armed and trained by the United States. The United States has set up a military operations base in western Ukraine, where they send in American Special Forces troops from Fort Carson, Colorado, to train these Nazi death squads to go and attack their fellow citizens near the Russian border. This is one of their battalions. You see the EU flag, the blue flag with the star, and then their Nazi flag as well. These are the people that the United States is supporting today. And one of the big supporters of these folks during the coup in 2014 was John McCain. Here, seen with one of the Nazi leaders, that's both him next to uh, McCain and also above him, one of the Nazi leaders and the United States politicians, not only Republicans, but Amy Klobuchar from uh, Minnesota running for president now in the Democratic Party. She's also gone, she also went with McCain on one of these trips where they embraced these Nazis in Ukraine. Now, I often like to ask people, why is all of this stuff really happening? Why is all this demonization of Russia, NATO expansion, the Nazis, why is all of this going on? And I think the end, the primary answer is climate change. You remember the map of Russia? The world's largest border with the Arctic Sea. And as the Arctic ice melts, the oil corporations want to go in and drill, baby, drill. And what recently, it's been in the news in the last couple of weeks, alternative media, that the RAND Corporation has come out with a study calling for the balkanization the breaking up of Russia into smaller countries to make it possible for the Western oil corporations to go and take control of the Arctic region so they can drill, baby drill. And in fact, now this, with the NATO expansion and this reality of the Arctic, we see NATO having war games increasingly, US and NATO, up in the region of what they basically call Lapland. Finland, Norway, Sweden, up in that northern range up there, right along the border with Russia. And so these war games are happening over and over and over again. And I ask you this question. What if Russia was holding war games along the Mexican border and in Canada? What would the US say today? What would the US do? 
in response. Here's another one of the war games. This one in Pola, Poland, rather, Anaconda 16, 2016. They've been holding them every year. Thousands of troops, thousands of uh, amounts of equipment. And the U.S. has now created a new base in Poland they're using as a storage hub where they're deploying weapon systems. They come there on a training exercise, bring these weapons from the United States, and then leave them there when they leave. And so the slowly but surely, they're creating this massive weapons hub in Poland. What for? This is one of my friends, a great artist from Florida, for many years has done artwork for the the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, where I worked before and now for the Global Network. This is one of his renderings. What the hell are you doing getting so close to your own border? Because when Russia reacts to these war games by holding military exercises in their own country, in their own country, near their border to say, you're not coming in, we accuse them. The US, the Western corporations, the Western media accuse them of being aggressive. The hotel we stayed in in Moscow, just across the street, was this beautiful, beautiful place. And on our first day there, we walked over there and walked all the way around it trying to figure out what it was. It wasn't until near the end we learned that it was a former palace that had been turned into a hotel. Just a beautiful first thing to see when we arrived in Moscow. This is the Veterans for Peace that Mary Beth showed you, the Russian Veterans for Peace, formed 20-some years ago. Uh, they made connection. You know, Maine was the originator of Veterans for Peace. And they came to America and came to a Veterans for Peace conference and decided they wanted to form a chapter there. They did. And they began coming to America, you know, to the annual conventions of VFP for several years. But then the Yugoslavia War happened during the time of Bill Clinton when Yugoslavia, Belgrade was bombed and Yugoslavia was broken up into smaller countries. And they said that since then they can't get visas to get in the country, into the United States. So they've largely been forgotten about. Most people in VFP now, nationally, don't even know that there's a Russian chapter. And it wasn't until Regis went there a couple years ago to Russia on a trip. And he went up, up to northern Russia where they're headquartered and met them. And as a result, when we were in Moscow, several of their leaders came. And they signed an agreement of cooperation uh, with Maine Veterans for Peace. I carried that along, this agreement, and it was signed uh, between the two chapters. So we hope in the future there's going to be more interaction again. This was a museum that uh, in Moscow, World War II Museum. They had these big rooms where... I would say the entire length of this wall were these huge artist renderings of various battle scenes, the most dramatic paintings that I'd ever seen in my life. They're just massive of life during that Nazi uh, occupation and attack of the former Soviet Union. And in that same museum, they had this picture. You see up in the right-hand corner, East meets West, an American GI and a Soviet soldier fighting the Nazis together, friends. And we heard this from people that, you know, we were once friends. We but what happened? Why did you just demonize us all of a sudden? Why, you know, what happened to that relationship where we did something together important that should be remembered? And in the same museum, I was very touched by this, inside a big round, round part of the museum, a big hall, there were some things on the outer walls going around, a big circle, and all that was left it was this big statue in the middle. And that was my experience over and over again in Russia, not a celebration of war, but a remembrance and the feeling of absolute suffering and sadness at what this war was. These people really, really understand war. They say that Sweden 
Well, first, let me start with Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan invaded and occupied Russia for some time. And then Sweden invaded Russia 40-some times. And then, of course, Napoleon invaded Russia. And then, of course, Nazi Germany, Hitler invaded Russia. And so their whole history is loaded with being invaded by other countries. They know what war is. This is outside the Space Museum in Moscow, a memory of the workers. They always remember the workers who created the space program. And the first astronaut, the dog, Laka, right here, is even memorialized in this. The subways, you've all heard about the unbelievable subways in Moscow. And each one is full of art. And each one is different. This particular one, remembering those who fought and died against the Nazis. No garbage cans anywhere inside of the subway. You can't find them. But no trash anywhere at all. Never. Mary Beth showed you this map. This is uh, Crimea right here. Here's Ukraine. Remember I told you the Nazis live in the West? That's this part right here. And so today they're being brought over to the Donbass, this side, along the Russian border, to attack people. And they shell schools, hospitals, daycare centers, train stations, airports, all kinds of civilian targets, housing blocks, and more than 10,000 people have been killed in this operation. This is us in uh, Simferopol on May 1st, May Day. And there's going to be a parade remembering the workers. May Day is a celebration of the workers. This is our hotel, the yellow building here. We're out, out front with our flags, and, and we're getting ready to go and join the parade. And we bring this No to NATO banner that we made. Will Griffin designed it, actually. And as we were waiting to start, these women came up, and they wanted to get their picture taken. And there was a whole series of people that followed them, wanted to get their picture taken with us in the banner. And what we later learned was there are 175 ethnic, ethnic groups in Crimea. And at this parade, many, many, many people were dressed in various ethnic costumes to honor those people, those cultures. So it was quite a, an experience. This is us marching in the parade. Veterans for Peace flag. And afterwards, we were taken to a conference in our honor. And on one side were these local leaders who spoke to us. And then on the other side was our delegation. And so they spoke to us, and four of our people spoke to them as well. I remember saying to them that we want to build a bridge of peace and one of them responded that in order to have a bridge of communication, it has to come from both sides. And we hope that that will be possible. We signed a letter of cooperation with the Black Sea Association for International Cooperation in Crimea. They're the group that's in charge of making sure that those 175 ethnic groups are supported and nourished and grow in the community. And so this is the leader of that group. And this is the chair of the Global Network, Dave Webb, from England, our chair. And they're signing this agreement of cooperation with the folks in Crimea. And we want to we take it seriously. We want to find how we're going to continue to work with them over time. This is the Lavadia Palace on the Black Sea in Yalta. You might remember in Yalta, after the war was over, Stalin and uh, FDR and Churchill met to discuss the post-World War II era. The United States promised to send money to Russia to help them rebuild after they were so devastated from the war. But instead, 
uh, the United States reneged on that offer, on that promise, and instead did the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. But Russia, or the Soviet Union, was left to its own devices without any assistance whatsoever, even though they, they did most of the heavy lifting in the war. And here inside of the Lavadia Palace, you see, and even uh, I, I would say they gave FDR the honored place in the middle. And in fact, in our hotel in Yalta, it's on Roosevelt Avenue. And right across the street from our hotel was a bust of FDR. Imagine that we would do that for any uh, Russian leader today. We were also taken to, uh, along the Black Sea again in Crimea, uh, just outside of Yalta, to a place called Artek. You might have heard during the days of the Soviet Union, they had pioneer camps where kids would go in the summertime. Well, Artek was the most famous of all. Beautiful, beautiful place, and it still runs today. Uh, after the uh, coup d'etat in 2014, when uh, the uh, happened in, in Kiev, in Ukraine, uh, the people of uh, Crimea voted to return to Russia, and we were told that this camp, Artek, had fallen in huge disrepair. Ukraine had really just left it to fall apart. And Russia today is rebuilding it, and it's an uh, it's unbelievably beautiful place. But one thing we, we learned about, and they have a bust of a manor inside of the Artek camp, someone that most of you have probably heard about, a young girl by the name of Samantha Smith from Manchester, Maine. In 1982, at 10 years old, she wrote a letter to then Soviet General Secretary Yuri Andropov saying, please don't uh, drop a nuclear bomb on the United States. I want to live. Please don't hurt us. And so he wrote her back, reassuring her that the Soviet Union was not looking to start a war. And he invited her to come to Russia. And so it, the next year in 1983, July, her and her mother spent two weeks in Russia, and they went to the Artek camp, where she stayed in a dorm with Russian kids her age. She became a spokesperson, and over the next couple years, she was touring around the world as a spokesperson for the peace movement, calling for good relationships between the United States and the Soviet Union. And then in 1985, her and her father were on their way home to Maine. They were in a small plane that crashed, and she was killed. Her, both her and her father were killed. They had a funeral in Augusta where a 1,000 Mainers came to honor her. A statue sits out in front of the uh, State Library in Augusta today. And Gorbachev sent a representative and a statement uh, to her funeral. So the people in Russia really remember her. And they remember her as a person that wanted peace, and they honor her there at Artek. Mary Beth talked about this place, the 35th Battalion in Sevastopol, Crimea, where we went down, way down, way down under the earth. And they say that as the Nazis came to this place, they closed in on it, uh, Soviet soldiers and sailors retreated here by the number of 40,000. They retreated to this 35th Battalion, came down inside, and the Nazis came and killed 30,000 of them right there at this place. And this, you remember, uh, there was a picture, I think it was Bill that showed the picture of the guide, the woman. And I remember one thing she said that really blew me away. She said, talking about the 30,000 that perished, she said, most of these people were not heroes. They were just human beings. And my mind, you know, is like, in America, every soldier is a hero, right? But that's not what they do there. That's not what they do. This is the operating room. Mary Beth mentioned. And when we came out, we were all crying. 
And I knew we had to do something. We had to make some kind of statement when we came out of there. Because the media, the Russian media was right here with cameras set up. They wouldn't let them come in and film us inside because it's a sacred place. But they were waiting for us. They wanted to get our reaction to this moving experience. And so we came out and we unfurled that banner. I felt like it was a good thing to do. St. Petersburg, our friend Tanya, that was our guide in Crimea, arranged for a friend of hers, Irina, this woman right here, who brought a picture of her grandfather. She took us and led us through the march on May 9th, the march of the immortal regiment, they call it. I carried a picture of my mother, her sister, and her two brothers, both of which were in the Navy during World War II, both of whom had their ships sunk by Nazis, and somehow, miraculously, they both survived. And so here we were. This was our, a lot of our people right in here from our, our group walking th in this amazing, amazing, amazing experience. 1.2 million people. Three-mile walk. Then we got to the Hermitage, the famous museum, art museum in St. Petersburg. And then it was over. And then we walked back to our hotel three miles. And I started counting pieces of garbage that I saw on the street as we walked back three miles after 1.2 million people had just come. And you know how many pieces of garbage I counted? Five. And I want you to imagine 1.2 million people at some kind of march or protest or parade in America. How many? Three miles. Wow. What does that tell you? It, I know it's, it's not a big political thing, but it tells me something about the character of these people that we demonize so much. This is Will Griffin, our friend again in St. Petersburg. He went to this cemetery. It's a mass grave for more than 500,000 bodies that died during the siege of St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad during the war. 900-day siege of the Nazis. Again, a reminder, Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic. You compare it to other Arctic countries, it doesn't compare whatsoever. This, I believe, is why we demonize Russia today. Thank you all.